living a life of faith. Living a life of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Living a life of faith. The Lord said to them, Why did you doubt? O men of little faith. Why did you doubt? O men of little faith. Let's pray. Father, we have come to you and to you alone for your for the grace you have bestowed upon us. Thank you for giving us this privilege to share in your word. And Father, I pray that you will open our eyes to the truth and that you will feed us what you have for us. Bless those under this roof. Bless those who are in their homes who have tuned in from all over the world. Take this message and let it be a source of blessing to all of us. In Christ's name, amen. Living a life of faith. We interrupted our study because of this special occasion we have today. Next uh, Sunday, God willing, we will continue with uh, the trial of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want to use this opportunity to share with us regarding uh, the message of faith. Living a life of faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. It is... Uh, I, why, what is this message so important to us? Uh, it, it is good to, to be, a, 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 whenever I look at my wife on that side where she is, she will know that probably I'm about to say something. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to be a pastor's wife. It's a blessing. I don't know how many of you would like to be a pastor's wife. Raise your hand. That's all right, don't raise your hand. My, we were talking yesterday, and uh, she, she, she knew I was exhausted, and I should be, because you need to travel with me to know how these people, they don't let an inch. They squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. At one point, they would tell me, point blank, you're going to be here just for a few days, and you'll be gone. And so we want to take whatever we can get from you while we are here. They will squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. And if they are carrying me, they, they, they get it to me sometimes. If they are carrying me from my hotel to the venue, like last time was an hour and a half plus traffic we had, they were just asking questions in the car. <laughs> and this was a person who would be speaking for hours. And after I would take a break, somebody would come while I'm sitting down trying to take a breathing. <laughs> What would I say? I tell them, no, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm tired. No. And so my wife, she knows that. She has lived through that. And she was kind of having a, a concern as a wife, which is what is a good wife should do. And she was saying, how can you preach, study, and teach this Sunday? Maybe... Maybe, why don't you just uh, teach one of the lessons you have taught before? So you don't have to go and study and spend time studying. Just, uh, I said, uh, and she came up with a, a message I, I, I can repeat. And she said, you can teach, like, uh, be anxious for nothing. I say, hey, that's a new, that's a good one, but you are, you're already anxious <laughs> about me teaching on Sunday. <laughs> you're already anxious about the energy, <laughs> about the strength. And we laughed about it. Indeed, God always supplies. I can uh, see when Paul said, my 
said, when, when the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, it is when you are weak that my strength comes forward. And so he gave me the strength to prepare this message, knowing that it is a very important message for us. Living a life of faith. Living a life of faith. I remember some years ago, I, I, I have said this before, some years ago I went to Poland on a mission trip. And the first thing the pastor, the host, the first thing the host told me was, can you pray? We have not gotten rain. This was my first trip to Poland. Can you pray? We have not gotten rain in three months. It hasn't rained in our land for three months. I, before I began my meeting, I prayed. I said, God, send rain to this, send much needed rain to this land. After a prayer, then after the conference, the meeting, I went back to my room. The first place that came to my mind was James chapter 5, verse 16. Turn with me to James, where we, so that we can begin the work on this so great, important message. James chapter 5, beginning from verse 16. James tells his audience, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. But where I want to pick up is the last part. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. In verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly. I put my finger in that passage. And what I put my finger in that passage is where it says, Elijah was a man with the same nature like me. In other words, Elijah was not different. Elijah wasn't different than you. Elijah was a believer in the Lord, in, in Yahweh, just as much as you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I put my finger in that. Say, so Elijah was a man just like you. And he said, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. He prayed. It didn't rain. Then in verse 18, it says, And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced fruit. So I, I read that passage after the conference. I said, God, you did this for Elijah. I want rain before this conference ends. I prayed almost all night and then finally went to bed. And when I, when I woke up, opened the window, it rained. It rained. It was like a movie to me. It was like a movie. <laughs> it's like uh, unbelievable. <laughs> it's like Peter. Peter was in prison and people were praying for him to be released. And somebody... Uh, Peter came and knocked. And he said, open the door. He said, who is it? It's Peter. <laughs> no, it can't be Peter. <laughs> what were you doing in the room? <laughs> you were praying for his release, and now he's released, and he has come. He said, it can't be Peter. And you told the other, you told the people in the, in the room praying. They said, oh, that's, that's his angel. So you were praying for his angel to be released. He <laughs> said, it can't be, that can't be Peter. So for me, I looked at it and said, wow, it really rained. So I went down to eat, the breakf to eat breakfast. My partner, George Mueller, said, God really answered your prayer last night. God does answer prayer. The, 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 the problem with us is that we have not challenged him. We, that, 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 
If I can, I can stand here and give you testimonies upon testimonies, this building that we are worshiping today is an answer to prayer, an act of believing that God can work a miracle. This is a, a, a $1.1 million property. In fact, it's more than that. When I, when, when I met the seller, I only had $600 in account with no other resources to back it up. But God gave it to us. Living a life of faith. Living a life of faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 38, that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Two questions facing us this hour. Two questions. Question us in this study, in this uh, message. A, what's one ingredient in your spiritual life, if missing, we rob you of the blessing of pleasing God. What one ingredient, this is important, what one ingredient in your spiritual life, if that ingredient is missing, it will, it will, it will, it will rob you from pleasing God. One ingredient, not two. What one ingredient? You know the answer? The answer is simple. Faith. Faith is the only thing that can rob you from pleasing God. Turn to our text in Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. The author of Hebrew tells us it defines faith. Let's just look at verse 1 where it defines faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's the definition of faith, biblical definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then this is where we got the answer in verse 6. And without faith... It is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It didn't say without faith, you may please God. God may. He said it is impossible. That word is strong. It is impossible. That means you cannot please God. I don't care what you do, whether you pray or whether you give offering or whatever you do, the Bible says you cannot please God. Do you want to please God? God says, there's only one ingredient that, can, that when, I, when I see in your life, it becomes evident to me that you are pleasing me. I didn't say that. It's not my opinion. It's not scholar's opinion. It is God's own word. Again, I read that verse again. And with that faith... It is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to believe to please God. So keep that in mind as we go through this uh, passage. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And B, the second question, remember I said we are going to deal with two questions. So if my voice is cranky, bear with me because I've been speaking for weeks. B, why is Abraham called the father of faith? Why is Abraham called the father of faith? We will use the remaining time to answer that question. Very important question. Again, the Bible says the, the, the just shall live by faith. 
living a life of faith. We are, as God's children, we expected to live a life of faith, not a life of doubt. Remember, Jesus said to them, you little men, you, why did you doubt, little men, men of little faith? Why did you doubt? In other words, if you did not doubt, you would have seen a result. If you didn't doubt, you would have seen something from what you wanted to do. In many passages, Jesus Christ talked about faith. He said, if you have a faith like a small, just a small mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, he pointed to the mountain, you can say to this mountain, be removed. Be removed. You can say to this mountain, be removed. And the mountain can be removed. And Jesus was speaking literal. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a meta- metaphor- metaphorical. Some people have tried to interpret it metaphorically. But he was actually speaking literal. How do we know it's literal? Because there was a, a parallel. He had already spoken to a fig tree. I said, this fig tree, stop bearing fruit. And they turned around thinking he was joking. It dried up. It wasn't metaphorical. It was literal. So if he points to a mountain in parallel, he's talking about literal. He could. If God wanted to do something, he can do it. If Joshua could command God to hold the movement of the planet from rotation so that he can finish his battle. Read Joshua. On his command, God held the nature. God held a lot of nature and the earth stopped its rotation. It's not metaphorical, literal. It is that doubt that comes into us that makes us to start explaining the scripture. Ah, that's a metaphorical. <laughs> no, it's little, my friend. Because there's nothing God cannot do. The same God who dried, are you trying to tell me that drying of the Red Sea is metaphorical? It's little. Sea that is so deep became a land. It's little. Why did you doubt? And uh, in many places, he said, let it be according to your faith. If you have faith, heal me. Say, if you have faith, I will heal you. There's something about faith that God honors wherever he sees it. The Bible says again, We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Sight, sight is one of the five basic human senses. Sight. When you talk about uh, the human senses, you talk about sight. You is what you can see. What you can touch, what you can smell, what you can taste, what you can hear. Hearing, these are the five senses. These five senses are against faith. They are the opposite of faith. Faith tells you you don't have to see it, you don't have to touch it, to believe it. Human sense is saying, no, that's the opposite. If I don't touch it, if I don't see it, if I don't smell it, I'm not going to believe it. That's what's, what uh, Brother Tom said when he was told that Jesus had resurrected. He said, nope, I can't believe it. Until I see it, until I see him, 
No, not just seeing him, but I, until I see where they pierced him, I was there when they was pierced. Until I see that arrow, the wound, because that wound wouldn't have healed in three days. Until I see the nail that they drilled through his palm, the scar should still be there. Until I see those, I will not believe. Nobody can convince me in this life. As he was just speaking, Jesus walked through the room, closed. In fact, that's how we'll be going during the, after the resurrection. After the resurrection, we don't need uh, to, nobody to open the door. He just walked through the door and go wherever you go, want to go. The science of the future is in resurrection. It's not going to happen any time until the resurrection. And so as he, they were arguing, Jesus showed up and said, Tom, come forward. He took his hand. He filled CC, see, aside. And then he took his hand and he let him feel, feel the hole where they pierced him. By all these feelings, this is feeling, this is seeing. He hid the ground and shouted, my Lord and my God. The first to call him God in resurrection. My Lord and my God. He didn't just say, my Savior, my Jesus, you know, my God, because Jesus is God, which is what John the Apostle was trying to demonstrate, that Jesus is God. My Lord and my God. Jesus could have said to him, excellent, wow, I like Tom. Everybody should be like Tom. Don't accept things until you prove it. No, he slapped him. Say, you, Tom. You only believe because you see. And he tells him, it is more blessed to believe before you see. More blessings come to those who believe without seeing. You and I are more blessed than the apostles who saw with their own eyes the resurrected Jesus. You and I are more blessed today who believed in Christ and those who saw him and saw miracles and believed. We walk by faith and not by sight. This, this brings us to Abraham, because that's our question. Abraham, Abraham, our role model. Abraham, our role model. What made Abraham unique? What made Abraham so unique? So different. Why all the Bible talks all up, talks about Abraham, Abraham. Everywhere you turn in the Bible, it's Abraham. The Jews, Abraham. Even Arabs, Abraham. It's a universal name. It's a brand name, Abraham. Why? What made him so unique? Now we're going to answer these questions. One. Let's look at Abraham from where he came from and from where he got and see if you can retrace, if you can pattern your own life that same way. A, one, a pursuit of the invisible. A pursuit of the invisible. It takes tremendous faith to leave one's place or position. It takes tremendous place Oh, tremendous faith to, for you to leave a very good condition to a place you don't know. You have no idea what you will see. You don't know what is there. And that's where we find Abraham. It takes tremendous faith. How many of us can be told today to leave our good paying job or our position and go to a place for Christ's sake that you don't know what will come dear. You have no clue what you will, uh, even if you can eat when you arrive. But you were doing well. And somebody just told you to leave. For Christ's sake. For mission's sake. For whatever it is. For the, for, for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. To do so requires faith. 
To do so requires faith. Genesis chapter 12. We are now looking at Abraham. Abraham was in his own country doing very well. Abraham, he didn't have any problem. He wasn't starving. Genesis 12, at the peak where Abraham was really progressing and doing well in verse 1, he says, now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Did you hear that? Leave your country. Leave your comfort zone. Leave all your friends behind. Leave everything you have accumulated. Leave the property you have purchased. Leave everything, the name you have made for yourself. Leave everything behind and go to a place that I will show you. And this is just a, this is just a promise. He didn't see it. He didn't touch it. There is no map given to you. You don't even know the place. Because the place is not mentioned. You didn't know where you're going. Just a place. Whether it's in the, in the wilderness, nobody there, no food, no nothing. Just a place. Go to a place that I will show you. Like I said again, it takes tremendous, takes tremendous faith to be able to just pick and go. And when I speak, I speak from experience. I speak from experience. I, when I, uh, my wife will uh, attest to that. When I began Grace Evangelistic Ministries 26 years ago, I had to leave my job completely and enter, start a ministry that I didn't know where the money would come from, who would support it. I have already determined that I will never ask a person a penny, a penny for mission or for anything. It's already sealed, written on my policy that I will never ask for money. No solicitation, no phone calls, no emails. God will provide for this ministry. If you have, first of all, if you have an in, interrupted my vision, my own ambition, and brought your own. It's your business to provide for it. That's my bargain with you. I'm not going to ask anybody a penny. I have not for 26 years. We've not done any fundraising at GEM, and I have been to almost 100 countries. God has abundantly provided for this needs. So I left everything. I left with my wife and uh, just trusting that God, I was convinced he called me, I was convinced without a shadow of doubt because he had already shown me everything to come to the conclusion that he called me with car wrecks, blocking everything in my life and just making me miserable so that I can abandon my own ambition to do what I'm doing today. So I just left. And it didn't take long. From east and west and south and north, God started sending support by the thousands of dollars to people I never, I did, some of them I didn't know them till today. I have many, I was just, many of them I have not even met them. Recently, recently I gave you all a testimony of a man, I never even heard his name, sent, had been collecting silver coins worth of thousands of dollars. I'll probably say over 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars and just mail them to us in the office. They start coming in our, in, our, in our office, in the mail, every time they send the box of coins. So they've been sending silver, 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 silver. I'll, I'll go home and tell my wife, somebody just sent us a, a pack of silver. And I'll go to this, we'll go to the silver, uh, the coin dealer to appraise, and they'll say, oh, that's worth 18,000. How <laughs> worth 15,000? The next day, another box will come in. And I told my wife, it's been silver and silver. But it goes says somewhere in the Bible. Silver and gold are mine. <laughs> We've been receiving silver all these weeks. <laughs> Every time we open the box, it's silver. <laughs> Not a single gold. I said, God said, silver and gold are mine. 
Wait and see. God is coming. <laughs> Not, and you're laughing. Uh, within a week, another box opened. Gold. I said, I told my wife, I told you. <laughs> God provides. Our problem is that we're not trusting him. And I keep telling that to ministers all over the world. <laughs> Your problem is not that God cannot provide. Your problem is that you're not trusting him. Elijah, if God knew where Elijah was, he didn't even use human being. He used a bird to bring him bread. He can provide for us if we can trust him. Abraham, a pursuit of the invisible. God told him to leave. Abraham picked up and left, not knowing where he was going with his wife. There was no GPS, no map. He just kept going, not knowing where he was going. The wife would keep saying, honey, have we arrived? Honey, we're, we're, we're just going anywhere. Nobody leaving this place. Are you sure, God? God, uh, God spoke to you. It wasn't just uh, uh, getting something in your brain. Abraham said, honey, God has told me. Let's keep going. That's what you call faith. Walking on the parallel, on the path of God's voice. And he, he kept going. God was pleased. That's what he tells us in Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. I'm speaking to you as a child of God. I'm speaking to you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you walk with God? How is your life marked? Doubt, fear, worry, anxiety, or is it marked by faith? knowing that you have a God who is able, a God who can, a God who has what it takes to deliver. That brings us to the second point. Faith in God's promise. Faith in God's promise. We have seen Abraham. We are now tracing the faith of Abraham. We have seen Abraham moved from his country, from his family, Going where there was no family, going where there was nothing, no connection whatsoever, to a place he didn't even know. God marked that on the record. God marked that for him. Now let's look at the next test. Number two, faith in God's promise. Faith in God's promise. Abraham was a man not only was he hearing the voice of God and the command of God, Abraham was also a man who was ready to act on God's promise. On God's promise. You know how many promises we have in the Bible today? Over 7,000. Over 7,000 promises for believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Bible, they are there. Frozen, if you can say, you can say that they are frozen. They're not taught because we have not taught them. They're still in the freezer. We have not brought them out so that they can talk. God has given you promises in the Bible. Where are they? In the freezer? Or did you bring them up on the open so that they will talk? They are for you. They are for me. They, a promise was given to Abraham. And God gave Abraham promise. You see? Our character, when we know God, when we understand God, our character changes. When we understand God, his, his own character, what God can do, it will propel us, it will move us to act on faith and not doubt. God has never been pleased with anybody that doubts. Even in salvation, if you doubt your salvation, you're not saved. If you doubt that faith in Christ is not enough for salvation, you remain unsaved. You're not saved. Because doubt, God doesn't like doubt at all. 
Abraham was told when he was old that you are going to have a baby. You're going to have a son. The wife laughed. <laughs> did he say? Did I hear her correctly? At that time, she was 75 years old. Abraham was 75 years old. And Sarah. Sarah was 65. And said, huh, a baby at my age, no more monopause, everything, all those things gone, dried up everywhere. I'm going to have a baby. That's the most hilarious thing I ever heard in my life. <laughs> have a baby? <laughs> which, 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 which a womb? <laughs> this one that is flat. And, and because she was laughing, God said, oh, because you were laughing, God, the Lord of Jesus himself, Yahweh, was talking to Abraham, promising him. The wife was laughing in, in, the, in, the, in the tent, inside the tent. Because she was kind of trying to listen to what they, if, if, if dropping what they were talking. And hearing that she laughed, the Lord told Abraham, why is your wife laughing? Abraham, because she didn't laugh aloud. <laughs> and the Lord said, why is your wife laughing? And Abraham said, oh, laugh? Who laughed? I didn't hear any laugh. The Lord heard the laugh. They even saw Sarah where she was pimping in the, through the pigeon hole. <laughs> because the Lord is God. The angel of the Lord that was speaking to Abraham is Jehovah himself. God. Because you laugh, because your wife laughed, we're going to call that boy Isaac. Laughter. That's the meaning of Isaac, laughter. Thanks to Sarah. If she didn't laugh, another name would have been given to him. <laughs> but Abraham was convinced. Abraham was convinced that God will carry out the promise he made. That God will carry out the promise he made. God will carry out his promise. Turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Yeah, come forward, come forward and take a seat. Come, come forward. There are seats here. Come forward and take seats. Romans chapter 4. Look at verse. Romans 4.18. In hope against hope, he, Abraham, believed. Abraham believed in order that the, he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. And without, look at verse 19 very carefully. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, you see what I'm saying? With the respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, Giving glory to God. He was giving glory to God even before there was conception. He was already giving glory to God even before Isaac was born. He was already thanking God based on the promise that God made to him. You can see why heaven was rejoicing. Heaven was seriously rejoicing on this man called Abraham. God just told you something, a word. First of all, your you are, you are baby, you are, you are, you are, you are, see, I told you, God has a good sense of humor. God has a good sense of humor. 
He told them he would give them a baby when Abraham was 75 years old. And they doubted. It's kind of, it's what kind of, the wife was laughing. <laughs> At my age? God said, oh, your age? You think your age, you're too, too, too old to, for a baby? Wait for more, 25 more years. You want something funny? Wait 25 more years. Then I will show up. Then by that, by that time, you all hope God. And God showed up. At age 100, Sarah, 90 years old, she became pregnant. God fulfilling the promise he made. When God promises, he will carry through. Nothing can stop him from his promises because he has the power to deliver what he has promised. So Abraham, in verse 20, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured. You see what he said? And being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Whatever he had promised, he was able to perform. Faith in God's promise. Abraham uncalled his faith on the promise, simple promise of God. Abraham knew that God's promise are solid rock. Nothing could come between his response to God's promise and his action. Nothing. He was ready to stand and act on the promise God made. What about you? Do you believe on the unbreakable, unchanging promises of God? Do you believe it? If you do, do you act on it? Do you as a believer? We're talking about one ingredient in your life that will rob you of pleasing God. One ingredient, lack of faith. If you don't have faith as a believer in the Lord Jesus, if you're not acting on, a, on faith on a daily basis, I can assure you one thing, you're not pleasing God. I don't care what you do. I don't care how much you pray. You can fast until you die. You're just not pleasing God. Because the Bible already said it. He said, with that faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11:6. six. That brings us to the third point. And the, the third and the last point. We're looking at Abraham. Faith in God's character. Faith in God's character. One, we see Abraham moving forward in acting upon God's direction. We see him putting his trust in the promise God has made. God has made so many promises to us in the Bible. Abraham fixed his faith in the promise God has made. But now he's going to put his faith in the character, in the whole being, in the whole makeup of God. That's the final one, faith in God's character. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 11. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 11. God had, already given a, God had already given Abraham a son as promised. And now, God is going to test him with regard to this promise. Verse 1. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Did you get that one? Burnt offering. Not just cut his throat and then come, out, come down. Burnt offering. Burn him. Cut him in pieces and burn him so that he will be ashes. Put charcoal, put wood all over him and set him on fire. We talk about Abraham. On one of the mountains of which I will tell you, he didn't tell him, just one of the mountains. He said, always, what I'll show you. 
But you and I, we like to see it before we act. If we don't see our paycheck come and then we count the number and that did that, uh, it's, not, it's not enough. If we don't see things, we can act and believe on it. Abraham was a man who was always willing to do what the Lord asked him to do. Verse 4. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw. No, no, verse 3, rather. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and his split wood. Ready for the burnt offering. And arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. And I, I want you to look at that verse 5 closely. And I and the lad Isaac, we go yonder, the mountain, and the cycle the word, we will worship and exactly, and we will return. <laughs> you get that? We will worship. I will burn him. But when I finish burning him, we will return. Capture Abraham's faith. I will slice his throat. I will lay the firewood, and I will burn him alive. When I finish burning him, we will return. He didn't say, when I finish, I will come back and then we can go home and leave the ashes there. He said, we, the same way you saw us go up, is the same way you see us coming down the hill, we will go home. My friend, that is the magnificent picture of faith hanging on the wall for the whole world to see. What was going in his mind? I'll walk you through, which might help you in life. What exactly was going on in Abraham's mind? What do you think was going on in his mind? God had made a promise to him that through Isaac, the whole world will be blessed. Not through other person, but through Isaac. The whole world will be blessed through his offsprings. Through him, many nations will come. And the same God who said through, through Isaac, the whole world will be blessed, is the same God who is challenging me to go and burn him. What was it going in his mind? Hebrews 11, verse 17 tells us. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. It tells us, this is a very important lesson. That's why I'm not ready to rush and run and leave you hanging. Hebrews 11. What is faith? Assurance of things not seen. Trusting in the promises that God will bring to pass whatever he has promised that God will bring to a conclusion the promise that he has made to us, that nothing on this planet earth can tamper, can change the promises that God has made. Look at verse 17. What was, what was Abraham thinking? By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up the only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. You got it? In Isaac, your descendants shall be called. That was the promise God made to him. And the same God is now asking him to go and burn him. And this is his conclusion in verse 19. He considered, he contemplated that God is able to raise Men, even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Wow. In other words, Abraham was thinking, 
God made me a promise. He hasn't fulfilled it yet. By and by, he will fulfill it. That was what he was thinking. If I caught him, if I burn him, it's not finished. God will bring these ashes back to human being. Until Isaac, through him, the descendants arise. He was ready to demonstrate it. He raised his hand with a knife to cut the throat, and the voice came forward. Abraham! Hold it. Don't, go, don't carry it through. You have passed the test. Read the rest, read the next, the rest of chapter 22. Blessings, God opened the window, opened heaven, and blessings poured upon Abraham to this very day. And why? Because he believed God. The Bible says, believe God and succeed. Do you believe God? As a child of God, what propels you? How do you act on it? On fear? On doubt? Or do you, have you come to a point whereby you say, I am persuaded that God is able to do that which he has promised. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, we bring the closing moment to anyone who is here without Christ, without hope, without eternal life. We want you to know that Jesus had you personally on his mind when he was hanging on the cross. Every sin that you have ever committed, past, present, and future was judged on the cross. There was not a sin, a single sin that did not go to the courtroom of the cross. God judged every one of them. Heaven was opened just because the payment was received in full. Jesus Christ on the cross shouted, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. God forsook him because he was paying for our sins. So where you are right now, you can put your faith alone in Christ alone and receive internal pardon. And my friend, when you receive God's forgiveness, it's permanent. When you receive the righteousness of God, it is permanent. For God cannot go back on his promises. He cannot go back on his word. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie, not the son of man that he should repent. If God says, believe, I'll give you eternal life. That's exactly what he meant. He will give you eternal life. He can never go back on his promises. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Right where you are, I'll call upon my brother David to close us in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you with thanksgiving for this service today, Father. We thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us to gather together to hear your word, Father. And we have seen the demonstration of two beautiful babies that man said cannot be here. You have preserved. Father, we know that you are capable of everything, no matter how small or how large. Our, fa our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, told us if we would only believe, we would receive whatever we ask for in prayer, Father. I pray that we would be able to take the word that you have given us and each and every day come before you in prayer knowing that you will answer our prayers, Father. And for that, we would give you the glory, the glory, the praise and glory. We know that we are here for your praise and for your glory, the praise of your glory. And I pray, Father, that we can live each and every day seizing every opportunity that you give us for every person that we meet, sharing this good news, Father. We pray to continue to to meet here every week, if it is your will, Father, to grow in grace and the knowledge of your word. We just come before you asking these things by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of our Lord 
and our Savior, Jesus Christ.